Hello, Bill. Hello, Sandy. I am neither Tom Cruise, nor am I Rob Lowe from the 1980s. Just to clear that mm. up. Okay. Your, your denim shirt says otherwise, but <laughs> I'll let it go for today. Okay. Well, on a much more serious note. Yeah. Life with theater. Um, I didn't make the title tonight to fit with our images. It is actually the title of the series of images we're going to discuss um, by an artist called Charlotte Salomon, who we have actually touched on before. So look at that. She's one of these artists who was totally obscure for such a long time. She had much greater sort of fame in France, mainly because the paintings we're going to look at that are part of this wider work life of theatre were made in France, uh, where she was in exile and hiding from the Nazis in the 40s. Um, but there's a great kind of great and sad story about Charlotte Solomon. And again, we did touch on it before when we looked at her work in context of other people's paintings. Um, but she came from a really, really affluent, well-connected, highly educated family in Berlin. Um, she was born in 1917. And ultimately she met her end uh, in the gas chamber in 1943 in Auschwitz. Um, but as a child growing up, she was no stranger to luxury. And actually her dad is credited, I think, with being the inventor of the first kind of mammogram. Really? Or, uh, you know, the machine that would, would create mammogram. So he was an oncologist, um, very well connected, knew everybody in kind of Berlin high society. But it was obviously an extraordinarily difficult time to be Jewish. And a very dangerous time to be Jewish and Jewish and affluent. Um, although unlike many others who were not so wealthy, they did have at least the option of paying at least a little their way to try to get to some kind of safety. So you say uh, 1917 to 1943? Yeah, 1917, she was born. So she was only, what, 26 years old? Is that what that works out to be? Six, yeah. Wow, okay. Um, and if that were not tragic enough, I mean, her life, regardless of this kind of wonderful, well-connected affluence, was marred by tragedy, a history of family um, suicide, mental illness, lots of scandal, secrets, quite a dark history in their family history. The reason why um, I suppose there was a, a sense of obscurity in the beginning is actually she gave her paintings away to somebody to keep secret. And that person then gave them to her parents after her death and they themselves kept them secret. For very good reason, because in amongst her paintings, there were 800 gouaches uh, that make up this, what's well, actually a book work, um, was a painted letter that was a confession to a murder she had committed. She killed, who'd she kill? Her grandfather. Wow. Mm. We'll come to that a little bit later, but this is one of the earlier paintings, and this is actually a representation of the family's apartment um, with its rooms, wonderful rooms. Well, how would you describe this work? Is this, is this surrealist? Is this, um, I mean, it's obviously dreamlike in, 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 in a lot of ways. It's, it's, it's like space warping. It's so it's a little, there's like a, little bit of like modern, like almost like cubism kind of thing going on in, in the way that some things are represented in, but, but it, it, but it, it does really feel like she's living inside of her own head. 
you know. Mm. Yes, I mean, there's an element of the kind of cartographic landscape of one's dreams or one's particular inner world perception of the outer world. And as a child growing up in a beautiful home with at, in, in her early years, um, both parents were still alive. You know, she, she had a relatively happy childhood, I think, right at the beginning. Um, she was still very small, I think maybe eight or nine, when her mother took her own life. Um, the family, like I said, was kind of marred with this, almost like a curse of suicide. Um, and not just because there were lots of people in the 30s in Jewish families who perhaps stored up uh, in an arsenal of, of poison so they could take their own life should the worst happen. These were particularly women in her family who even before Hitler became chancellor were, were kind of leaping into rivers and jumping out of buildings and attempting to hang themselves. So she'd actually been told as a child that her mother um, had died from the flu. Yeah. Uh, but by all accounts, Charlotte had grown up with a, a mother who was so full of kind of imagination and they used to share stories and um, her mum used to say things to her like, you know, I will return from the afterlife to visit and you must watch for an angel at your window when I go. And so in some ways, perhaps the, the very young Charlotte was quite sort of prepared in one way for, for death. Mm, but sadly, I mean, death really did follow her around uh, in, in all kinds of ways. Um, I do see a lot of her work as dreamlike. Some people describe it as looking from the outside in at one's own life. But I don't see it as being on the outside. I don't feel that Charlotte's on the outside of it. I feel that she is commanding it. She's- no, I, I feel like we're inside of her head. You, she's the, 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 the fat controller, so to speak, of, yeah. of the whole thing. I mean, this one in particular has sort of a Chagall kind of feel to me. Yeah, there's an element of Chagall. There's also a lot of Matisse in her work. But if we look at the convergence yeah. of art history round about the time when she was making this work, which would have been in its entirety painted between 1940 and 42, when she was, as I said, in exile in the south of France. Um, she was under enormous stress in some ways, obviously, in 1940, she had been separated from her parents. I think her father had managed to somehow pay for papers to get out of some kind of labor camp in the, in the north somewhere. But she and her grandparents had traveled to the south of France. Her grandmother tried to hang herself. Charlotte rescued the grandmother. Um, but then eventually the grandmother succeeded in taking her own life. And Charlotte was left alone then with her grandfather. Um, and the woman who ultimately took Charlotte in after her grandfather's death uh, was a woman called Ottilie Moore, who was an American heiress who uh, had a, a beautiful chateau, beautiful home, L'Hermitage, just outside of Nice, where mm -hmm. she hid or at least accommodated particularly women in exile, children in exile, people fleeing uh, Germany um, and, and often single Jewish women who were, who were pregnant. I think I mentioned it when Charlotte was gassed, she was five months pregnant. She arrived on the, on the train at Auschwitz, she was taken straight away. She, you know, she didn't get separated into a work group or anything. She was just gassed on arrival. Um, she was five months pregnant at the time. And she actually met her husband who she was going to have the baby with because he had been a lover of Ottilie Moore. So 
there are lots of kind of crossovers and convergences. I'm not really explaining life or theatre very well, though, and I just do want to say about it. Life or theatre is a book work. I mean, I have the, the book here. I've got a pretty cheap version of it, but it is a vast um, book work. One might call it a tome. Yes, it's very, very big, very heavy. And this is is, like is, a, is is in Germany, is in in the original German or French or whatever this is originally German, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, is is there a question mark after the life as well? Or yeah. is that something they've done? For, okay. So, I mean, they're okay. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So the thing, apart from its sheer scale, you know, two years worth of work, sometimes she was painting two or three gouaches a day. And they were always the same size, I think 22 by 30 centimeters. Um, she collected them all together in a folio and they recorded the life essentially, her own life, but everybody had a kind of pseudonym. So characters that were uh, in fact real became fictitious through kind of uh, slight changes in their name, like uh, someone she knew called uh, Mr. Singer became Mr. Singsong and Wolfson, who was her first lover and the great love of her life, became uh, Daberlorn, I think, something like that. Anyway, but people had these kind of fanciful names. And what she did is she combined text with her painting. She often did overlays of text where, you know, you'd even kind of say it was a precursor to kind of like almost like beat poetry, constant stream of consciousness. Um, sometimes not gobbledygook, but quite sort of abstract thoughts would be written or painted into the gouaches. And ultimately as a book work, I think, I mean, one could really see it as a, as a graphic novel. Um, I, I think that what's interesting about this time period, but could you go to the next one for a second? I think it might be the, yeah, that there's, there's sort of a, a, a dichotomy, a crisscross of elements here where um, she is creating, her life is probably relatively small while she's in exile mm. and it's terrifying. So she creates this sort of, inner world where she's free in some ways, it feels like in a lot of these paintings. And so she, in some ways she's creating theater within her own head out of life. But at the same time, you know, things like fascism and the Nazi party in general, were creating grand theater in real life. Yes. It's, it's like this, it's, 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 it's a, like life becomes theater, becomes life, becomes theater, becomes life. It's like, you know, it crisscrosses back and forth. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no question that, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's satirical. What I would say, though, is that actually as, as a whole, even though Solomon would have been working uh, under threat to her life, actually things like um, being hounded or chased by the Nazis is actually a very small part of the actual work. What a lot of the, the paintings are actually about is much more uh, immediately personal. So, you know, we have lots and lots of paintings where we see kind of quite a romantic um, sense or sensibility with the character Charlotte. Now, Charlotte keeps her name, her first name, Charlotte. Um, but, you know, they become the, the cans, the Sh Charlotte can, K-A-N-N, -N, in, the, in the story. And uh, also she intended this to have musical prompts throughout. So there's suggestions for what, what one would hear whilst looking. And there's all kinds of quite sort of poetic text and prose alongside the paintings. Um, it's an unfolding story, which is why it's like a graphic novel, but it's like a graphic novel plus, plus, plus. It's got so much to it. The paintings on their own could be seen as naive. They could be seen as actually highly sophisticated modern, modern art. Um, yeah. But as a collection, they become this, you know, autobiographical portrait 
over nearly 800 images. Um, but the thing that strikes me, and it reminds me of a story somebody told me who was working in, in Glasgow as part of an interfaith community project, um, that people were arriving, um, particularly from Syria, to be housed as uh, you know, asylum seekers or refugees. Scotland agreed to take so many people who were particularly vulnerable. And lots of sort of social services were put in place to support those people. And uh, this person working for the Interfaith Project said to me that actually what was fascinating is that these particularly women would come and would, would talk together and would want to talk. Um, but they didn't talk about, you know, the horror of war. They wanted to talk about a man they'd met or sure. this boy they liked the look of or where they... Well, because they, they want some semblance of normal life within what is otherwise sort of an absurdist situation. Yeah, and I definitely feel with with, the, with this work, with Life with Theatre, all the way through it, there is terrible confusion, a sense of grief and loss, but it's kind of shown through the prism of actually something that is also about ordinariness. I mean, Charlotte Solomon to me is definitely not ordinary, and not an ordinary character at all, somebody who's most definitely a singular person, somebody who's highly unusual anyway, very intelligent, um, an astute woman, uh, whose life obviously tragically cut short by a heinous crime, her murder in Auschwitz. Right. But even though that threat was present all throughout this work, the things that she cared about were the, the men in her life and also the more immediate family or familial history that so troubled her, which was again to do with this fact that in her family, eight of her relatives had taken their own lives and had yeah. suffered enormous mental turmoil. Well, I think when you're when you're going through hell, the one thing you want is some level of normality. And she's still a 18 to 26 year old girl, like during all you know what I mean? She's a she's a young person during this time, doesn't stop her from being a young woman just because she's going through all this stuff. In some ways, she gets to live out normality within this sort of quasi dream world that she's creating in art. You know, right. I mean, it's like, I mean, obviously these, some of these people are real, but it, she's obviously embellishing them and turning them into theatrical figures just well, by changing why, their names and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why the title is also so interesting. I mean, you were saying that earlier, but she did, she did merge fact with fiction, you know. How can you tell the difference in her work? Does anybody, exactly. has anybody figured that out? Yeah. But also, does it really matter? Do we have to tell? I mean, the thing is, is that we do know through accounts of her family that actually most of what is happening or has happened in life or theatre has a direct relationship with something that really did happen. Yeah. Um, with characters who really were people. Um, what I find sad is uh, I get the impression that uh, she really did feel maybe abandoned, must have been terribly difficult for her parents. It wasn't actually her mum, her mum, as I said, committed suicide when Charlotte was still a girl, but her stepmother um, and her father, you know, they, they outlived her. They didn't get carted off. Um, and they're the ones that eventually took receipt of all these paintings had to work out what the hell to do with them. Well, the answer was to hide them. Um, the text, I actually, I, I gave this to my friend Ilza so she could help me with some sort of loose translation. I mean, this one is very much about Wolfson, her, her real life lover, her first true love. Um, the kind of conversational element of almost like self-chiding, uh, 
uns being a bit uncertain or maybe a bit coquettish. In this one, like the idea of almost like the talking heads looking on society, maybe the many faces or facets of society. Also an element of perhaps not being able to trust, not being able to trust anyone. Sure. Um, and why would you? I mean, she'd been surrounded by people who possibly were mentally unstable within her own family. And then the outer world was so hostile to her. Sure. The outer world was trying to find her. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this image, which you immediately picked out when we ran through these before we started, is of her grandfather. And it actually doesn't appear as one of the paintings. It's not a painting in her book, Life of Theatre. But it is a very significant drawing that she made. And it's of her grandfather. Now, After she killed him? She... She murdered her grandfather. Why did she murder him? Because he had sexually molested her. Ah. So where her grandmother had attempted suicide and failed and then eventually managed it, um, she was left alone with him in the south of France. And at that time, he, by all accounts, persistently and consistently requested that she share a bed with him. And I don't know whether it was that in his old age and through his trauma and suffering of everything that had happened to him, he yeah. became like that. Or whether there was also an implication that even when she'd been a much younger child, he had been molesting her as well. But she despised him. And actually she did say somewhere something along the lines of, you know, it's not the third Reich I fear it is much closer to home or something like that. And in some of the, the, the text throughout Life of Theatre, there is this allusion to a direct threat to her within her own close network. Um, and she made this drawing as he was dying in front of her. I think she'd fixed him a meal with poison in it and she fed it to him and she watched him die. Not for nothing that even if he did abuse her, that's some dark stuff right there. Drawing the person as they're dying that you're just killing. Well, I'm going to say something quite controversial, but who the hell are we to judge? Yeah, I'm just saying that like there's something going on in your head if, if, if that's what you're doing. It's hardcore. Yeah, but I think she did hate him. She despised him but she couldn't get away from him because where else should she go? Yeah. And then finally, well, how did she, how did she live without it with him dead? Well, that's, that's when Ottilie Moore. Oh, I see. Got it. Came on the scene. I mean, it surprised me actually that, uh, that she and her grandfather did evade capture for such a long time. I think they did get interred somewhere for a while together and somehow managed to get out again. I mean, people's lives at this point in history are often so <laughs> extraordinary. You know, we kind of pleasure and stimulate ourselves with all these rather fantastical stories and bits of cinema. But actually, fiction is not often half as intriguing as, as real life was actually happened. Her life I is totally agree. fascinating. Uh, that's why I read very little fiction and mostly nonfiction. What's really kind of sad too is that she made it to 1943. Had she made it another six months or so, she probably would have survived. You know, the, the D-Day would have happened. France would have been taken over again. She probably could have gotten away with it. I don't know. I get a funny feeling about her that There, there is something so fateful in all of it. Well, that is that is a very Sandy Robertson view of this, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. is this the, uh, is this the... Uh... Taking up 
confession the last few pages in the book work life of theater is this which i suppose we could still class as a painting it is painted in gouache but it is the written statement the confession uh, and she fully intended it to go with her paintings and it's why when her work was eventually given to her parents, her dad and her stepmother, I think for 10 years, they didn't share it. They couldn't show it to anyone. Um, there was an exhibition of her work at the Royal Academy. Was it at the Royal Academy? The National? I can't remember, but it, in the late 90s. And as I said, she had quite a lot of sort of fame in France, but outside of that, she was not well known at all. Um, and then I guess in the sort of 2014, 15, there was a really good article written about her in the New Yorker. There was an exhibition of her work at the Jewish Museum, I think in Amsterdam. And suddenly a kind of more kind of public consciousness of her work came into being. I think her work is really, really significant work. In fact, I've got something here. The art historian Griselda Pollock said that um, life of theatre um, is an event in the history of art. You know, this book work was actually a seismic shift away from kind of single painting. It's in many ways sequential painting. It's autobiographical portrait. It is autofiction that blends fact with fiction. It has an overview of somebody's life that comes from many different strands of um, almost like our layers or levels of perception. So we see, uh, but we can read. We have literal stimulation. We have a sense of the, the, the sound or the soundtrack of yeah. all of this because we have- It's also the, the, the historical context and the fact that she soon after died, I mean, has a very sort of, you know, Anne Frank element to all of it too. Well, actually um, there, is, there is something about that though. Um, and I can't remember if it was in that New Yorker article or if it was somewhere else. There's something, there's a good article also on the Smithsonian website about her. But that something that has perhaps rather kept her in obscurity, even though she's found a wider fame overall, is that she is kind of lumped in as a Holocaust artist. Yeah. Or as somebody who's who's paired somehow with Anne Frank. And in actual fact, people started just using her name Charlotte kind of eponymously. Uh, but in a sort of, in a context of it being very particular to Holocaust. Now, it's not denying that she made this work throughout a period where that was pressing upon her. And ultimately, that's how she lost her life. Nonetheless, the work isn't just defined by that. It's no, but if this was some girl in the Midwest United States at the same time period, do you think it would have the same intensity? I think it's an important part of the story, but nonetheless, I don't think it has to be the defining yeah. feature. I think maybe what it is, is that it is the, uh, the, the, the starting gun of it. I, I, I mean, I don't know, of course, but, but it does feel like this is in some ways a reaction to what she was going through. And had she been living a more normal life, this may never have, this work may never have been created in the first place. But hang on, when we say more normal life, you know, even without the rise- Yeah, she had a screwed up family and yeah, yeah. Had such a, <laughs> a rich catalog sure. to choose from in terms of her yeah. material for inspiration. Um, her life, as I said, we've discussed extraordinary uh, range of characters that she would have met, a most bizarre, at times unfortunate, tragic, yet also 
incredibly strange and wonderful family. Um, sure. People of, uh, dare I say, people of substance, of intellect, of of interesting people, people who were interesting and and probably interested in more than simply uh, the nuts and bolts. I, you know what's interesting is that I don't I don't know why. Well, other than the fact that it's a woman, a young woman artist who died young. It's a was it Francesca Woodman? You know the photographer. I, I get a similar. It feels like a similar story to me, even though Woodman I think killed herself, right? And then this is a completely different situation, but. It does feel like this work was created, was forged in a in a very hot fire. Mm. You know, and I think maybe maybe wartime was that fire and being a Jew in Europe and all the rest of it. I mean that you might be right. I guess we'll never know, but but there definitely seems something that, that says I need to get this out because I don't know how long I have, you know. I, I agree. She, she herself may have been suicidal, like like her mother and grandmother and everybody else before well, them. You know, I I do think that there's um. I do think that she celebrated that she survived. There's there's something written, uh, some evidence from a diary or something where she really celebrated the fact that she'd survived. What cruel irony, you know, within a year and a half of completing this work and with her yeah. first child in her belly, she's murdered. Um, but yes, I mean, pressing upon her, of course, but isn't that also actually the, the kind of like impetus, the drive for most artists? It's like, you know, we want to get our lives down on surface. Yeah. We want to make permanent that which is not through our art making. Um, anyway, this painting is the last, is the final image. And on her bare back, life of theatre. And there she is painting at the edge of the Mediterranean, who knew what was to come. Did she have a kind of prescient, a prescience that, you know, the end was nigh? Well, the end is always nigh. And as I said, she lived a life in which death was present. She grew up with a mother who spoke to her all the time about, about death. Your, your whole concept, the end is always nigh, is true and frightening. <laughs> Mm. I do wonder with her about her incredible, like a guile and grace. You know, she loved passionately, deeply. Do we know what she looked like? Yeah, you can see some photographs of her. Okay. Um, there's I'll one in particular, up, so I think I she's see. with her father and her stepmother flanking her. Um, or maybe it's no, actually, there's photographs of her with her grandparents. Yeah, there we go. Can you see it? Interesting. Yeah. I mean, thinking about this, this is so stylistically different, but you know, we look at other artists who've traced their life in a kind of long line of portraits. Someone like Rembrandt, for example, who painted himself frequently over his yep. very long life, and we can trace his aging. Um, and likewise, even when I spoke to Stuart Semple the other day, you know, I talked to him about how you can trace his evolution from his teenage years through into his maturity. We looked at Rothko. We could see in early work how he kind of arrived in his classic period. With Charlotte Solomon, we have a two-year period where she was already 
you know, she had been at art college in Berlin. She was an artist. Yeah. Um, but in this two year period, it's almost like we, she fitted the whole of her life into a short span of time. Why she did it, I, I don't, I don't know, but yes, pressing upon her the, the external fear, the constant threat, you're right, would have been very intense. Yet the work isn't just about that. Well, it's a weird thing when, when you're being stalked, or I can imagine if, if you know, you're very sick for some reason, or, or maybe just, you know, normal person, that there's a, there's a ticking time bomb going on, you know what I mean? Like a, a certain amount of intensity. I think some people feel that greater than others, that sort of drive. Um, yeah. Amy. So is this more life or more theater? Which one is it? <laughs> well, I wouldn't put the or. I would just have an is. Hmm. Good one. Anyway, Bill, thank you. As always, Sandy, anytime.